Welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. For episode 92, we're going to begin in 2 Samuel chapter 21. Now, I think that this is probably out of out of place. This is probably not in the right time, okay? One of the clues for that is, now there was a famine in the days of David for three years. So, in the days of David. It's just kind of a general story. Uh, we're not exactly sure where this fits in, in the, the line of David, but it's not bad that it's included here towards the end of his life. It's just probably not in the right spot. Now, there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David sought the face of the Lord. And the Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul and his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. Now, if you if you remember back in Joshua chapter 9, the Gibeonites were the people who deceived Joshua and the, and the rest of the Hebrew army. Because they lived in the land of Canaan, but they saw that the people of God were destroying the people of Canaan. And so they pretended like they lived far away. Remember, they wore worn out clothes, old sandals. They had stale and and moldy bread. They had uh, wine skins that were cracked and broken. And they're like, oh, we came from really far away. Make a covenant with us. Let's be friends. And then Joshua made a covenant with them, but found out later that they lived in the same land. So Joshua promised them they wouldn't put them to death but they would conscribe them to servitude in the house of the Lord and those kinds of things. And the Gibeonites said, fine, so long as we're not dying, right? In the days of Saul, he tried to put all these Gibeonites to death. He tried to to break that covenant that Joshua had made with him. So there was a famine in David's days. Why in David's days? We don't know. Is it possible that this was at the beginning of David's ministry? Yes, that's possible. So we're not sure. So verse 2 So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not the people of Israel, but the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? And how shall I make atonement that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, it is not a matter of silver or gold between us and between us and Saul or his house, neither is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. And he said, what do you say that I shall do for you? They said to the king, the man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel, let seven of his sons be given to us so that we may hang them before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I will give them. So they said, look, give us seven of Saul's sons that we can hang in Gibeah of Saul. Gibeah is the city all the way back in Judges, uh, uh, what is that, 19, 20, and 21, where the Benjamites had had molested the woman, and Gibeah is where Saul was from, Gibeah is where Saul spent most of his time. So the king says, I'll do it. But the king spared Mephibosheth, so we know it's at least when David's ruling over Israel, the son of Saul's son, Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son. The king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, who she bore to Saul, uh, Armani, and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Merib, and the daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Meholathite. Those are a lot of hard things to say. And he gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the mountain before the Lord, and the seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest at the beginning of barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until rain fell upon them from the heavens, and did not allow the birds of the air to come upon them by day or the beasts of the field by night. David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, had done. Uh, the concubine of Saul had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the men of Jabesh Gilead. You'll remember that Jabesh Gilead rescued basically the people of Benjamin. And then uh, when Saul died, the people of Jabesh Gilead also took his bones and away from the Philistines, gave him a home. And he, and So let me read this again. Verse 12, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son, Jonathan, from the men of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hanged them on the day that the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. And he brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son, Jonathan, and they were, and they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. And they buried all the bones of Saul and his son, Jonathan, in the land of Benjamin, in the tomb of Kish, his father. And they did all that the king commanded. And after that, God responded to the plea for the land. Now there was war again between the Philistines and Israel, and David went down together with his servants, and they fought against the Philistines, and David grew weary. And ish one of the descendants of the giants, so pay attention to that, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze, who was armed with a new sword, thought to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. 
Then David's men swore to him, you shall no longer go out with us to battle lest you quench the lamp of Israel. After this, there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. Then Shibakai the Hushite struck down Saf, who was one of the descendants of the giants. There's another descendant of the giant. And there was war again with the Philistines at Gob. Uh, and Elhanan, the son of Jareh Origem, however you say these names, the Bethlehemite struck down Goliath the Gittite. This is a different Goliath, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was war again at Gath, which is where Goliath was from, where there was a man of great stature, not quite a giant, I guess, who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. And he was also descended from the giants, descended from the giants. So we've got four guys now, right, that have been descended from the giants. Um, and when he taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, struck him down. These four were descended from the giants in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David, by the hand of his servants. So this right here is why some people argue that David picked up five stones when he went out to face Goliath. He killed Goliath, one of the giants, and then there are these four other who have descended from the giants. This is why some people argue that David took five stones. This is years into David's reign as king, so maybe there's a relationship, but probably not. So then uh, 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 18 are identical. So 2 Samuel 22 is recorded for us, this, this Psalm of David, this cry of David is beautiful, but it's also in Psalm 18. So we'll read Psalm 18. We're also, by reading Psalm 18, reading 2 Samuel 22. So they are identical. And it, it would help you if, uh, in your Bible to make a footnote to cross-reference each to the other. So here's David's statement. Beautiful psalm. He says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. And then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. So two things I want to point out really quickly. Well, one thing for now. Uh, he says, in my distress, I called out to the Lord and he heard my cry. And now we're going to read these few verses where he, God rouses himself in, in power and in anger to come against David's enemies, and he comes to the aid of David. So he cries out to, to God for help, and God helps. In verse 41, we're going to see that the enemies of God cry out to help, and God does not help. And I need you to keep that in your mind. So look at God's response here to David crying out for help. The earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. This imagery here is really represented for us in Isaiah 64, uh, 1 and 2. It says, God, Isaiah is petitioning God and he's saying, rend the heavens, rip the heavens apart and come down. Micah chapter 1, 2 through 4 talks about how he comes down onto the mountains and he melts them like wax. I love these images of, of God coming in his power to the earth. And uh, I, I just, I, I think they're fantastic images of God's power and his might. So it says in verse 10, God rode on a cherub and he flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds, dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through the clouds. The Lord also thundered in the heavens and the Most High uttered his voice. Hailstones and coals of fire and he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke. O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. God sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. Now, this is where it gets interesting. According to the cleanliness of my hands, he rewarded me. So David, you do need to remember that God says of David that this is a man who is after my own heart. David is a man after my own heart. He did right. We haven't gotten to this part yet. We will, but he, he did right in everything except for with Uriah the Hittite. And so David as a whole is seeking God. He is pursuing the Lord. And so this is what David is speaking to here. 
He says, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me and his statutes I did not put away from me. All his rules were before me and his statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him and I kept myself from guilt. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, again, according to the cleanliness of my hands in his sight. With the merciful, he's speaking of God here, with the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. Uh, with the purified, you show yourself pure. With the crooked, you make yourself to seem torturous. For you save a humble people, but the haughty you will bring down. This is a theme throughout the entire Bible that God gives grace to the humble, but that he op opposes the proud. And he go David goes on to say, For it is you who lights my lamp, the Lord my God lightens my darkness. By you I can run against the troop, by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord and who is the rock except our God, the God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. So God is the one who made his way blameless. Don't miss that. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand has supported me and your gentleness has made me great. You gave me a wide place for my steps under me and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them and did not turn back until they were consumed. I thrust them through so they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet for you. Equip me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise up against me sink under me. And then listen to this. You made my enemies turn their backs and those who hated me I destroyed. They cried for help, the enemies, but there was none to save them. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. So this idea here is, remember back in verse 6 and, six and 7, when David cries to the Lord, the Lord answers him. But when the enemies of God, because that's really what they are here, when the enemies of God cry to the Lord, God does not answer them. David goes on to say, I beat them as fine as dust before the wind. I cast them out like mire in the streets. You delivered me from strife with the people. You made me the head of the nations. People whom I had not known have served me. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came tre trembling out of the fortresses. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Exalted be the God of my salvation. The God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me. Who delivered me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You rescued me from the man of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed one. To David and his offspring forever. And so... Just an incredible psalm about David feeling at the beginning. And a lot of David's psalms are like this. At the beginning, he feels overwhelmed. At the beginning, he feels uh, like the enemies are too many, that they're mounting against him, that he doesn't stand a chance, and he calls to God. And then this poetry here, it's beautiful poetry, speaks of the power of God and how God rouses himself in power and comes in majesty and comes in glory and comes in strength. And he... he, he pushes the enemies of David away, and then David is given victory, and David is given success, and he says that you are the God of my salvation. You are the God of my power, and so beautiful stuff. I mean, like, um, I'll challenge you this. Spend five minutes, 10 minutes today, and sit down and write Write a psalm, right? Write a couple of lines declaring, this was my worry. This was my fear. This is how God showed up. This is how God proved himself to be God. And now, where does David end? You have set my feet on in broad country. You have put me on sure ground. So like journey with David. I'm telling you, man, like journey with David. We'll get into the Psalms pretty soon, but journey with David through the Psalms and just see how he begins with anxiety and he ends with confidence in the Lord. And, and just maybe take a moment to write down a few lines for yourself. What an incredible, uh, interesting thing that would be to reflect on times in our life that we thought were challenging, where God came in and provided support and strength. And then we praise God for his goodness. Uh, if you want to read ahead for tomorrow, read 2 Samuel 24 and 1 Chronicles 21, and I will see you then. Have a great day. Thank you so much for journeying with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. 
not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.